I think I forgot to start. Okay, sorry, so I start recording now. We lost a little bit. P of W given S and P of S. Okay, so the generalization error is a function of two quantities. One is PS, the distribution of the training set, which is actually just IID PZ. Okay? And P of W given S, which comes from the algorithm. So the generalization error is a, and now we are going to have an explicit bound that depends on P of W given S and PS. The VC dimension based bounds are completely agnostic to these quantities. They just depend on the complexity of the hypothesis class, regardless of what the learning algorithm is, what the initial distribution is, and so on. They say with probability greater than 1 minus delta, E out is less than E in plus a quantity that depends on the VC dimension, right? Here it's not going to be the case. Here, our generalization error, we are explicitly parameterizing it as a function of the training distribution and a function of the algorithm, P of W given S. Any questions so far? So can you just repeat what you were saying? So E out is sort of dependent on the uh, marginal distribution, whereas E in is the going distribution, right? That's right, that's right. E in depends on the, and that is exploited in this information theoretic bounds. E out, you are already taking PZ, so it's a function. PZ is not conditioned on W here, it's a fresh sample. W is random, so then you take the expectations with respect to the PW. So you are, in a sense, having a product. Here, this is a joint because W itself is a function of S, and it's, so that these ZIs are dependent with respect to W, and that is going to be exploited. Independent. Yeah, but Z is a fresh sample. When you compute the test error, we you evaluate it on a fresh sample, not on the training points, right? So that's usually how it always do. That's usually how that we define these quantities, right? E in is always a function of, when we compute E in, W was generated as a function of the ZIs. There is a correlation here. For E out, we take L of W and Z, where Z is a fresh sample, and then take the expectation with respect to Z. So the main result this is by Russo and Zhao. This is the first paper where this appeared in 2016. And Zhu and Raginsky. This was a new rips paper that appeared in 2017. Russo and Zhao basically had the main proof, but they wrote it in a slightly different way, and Zhu and Raginsky built up on it. And so this was in Europe's, I don't know which conference the first one was. I think it's one of the top machine learning conference, maybe AAAI or something. I don't know exactly. You can check the reference. Uh, they had their preprint out, I think, in late 2015. So that's when the result actually came out. What they showed is that this quantity gamma of P of W given S and P S, and we do put an absolute value, I should mention here, because it can go both ways. So we just want the gap. So this is an absolute value here. Um, so generalization, the other, we only have to talk about an upper bound, no, not a lower bound now, uh, is less than a quantity like this. 2 sigma square over n i of w and s. Here i of W and S is the mutual information between the weight vector W and the training set S. So the more correlated you are between W and S, the higher the generalization error could be. It's captured by the mutual information. If W is completely independent of S, then the generalization error will be zero because whatever you get on training will be the same as the test. Um, here, what is sigma? Sigma square is a loss dependent
term n is of course the number of training examples so what is sigma square we have to make a small assumption in this derivation that the loss function l of w and z the function of the takes the weight and the current training sample and produces an output we'll assume that for any fixed w L of W, if you think of the loss function as dependent on Z for a fixed W, is what is called sigma square sub Gaussian. Basically, if you assume the loss function is sort of bounded between, say, two in, in an interval, then these assumptions are always satisfied. So, if let's say it's between 0, 1, then this assumption is satisfied. But more generally, what we need is a property that the loss function is, is sigma square sub Gaussian. This is sort of used in many of these papers. And what that really entails too is that if you, as sigma sub Gaussian with respect to the distribution PZ. Okay. And what that means is for any fixed W, L of W is a random quantity for when you change Z here because Z is sampled from PZ. So this random variable decays faster than a Gaussian distribution in, uh, with variance sigma square. In the sense that if you look at expected value over Z e to the lambda of L of W and Z minus expected value of L of W and Z with respect to PZ. So here W is fixed, Z is sampled from the distribution PZ. So this is basically looking at the center, the centering L of WZ. Okay. So this is the moment generating function of this random variable with respect to PZ. This is smaller than e to the lambda square sigma square by 2. This is a definition of a, of a sub Gaussian random variable. So for simplicity, if you don't want to go into all these details, we can assume, for example, that L of W and Z lies in the interval 0 to 1. If you assume your loss is in a bounded interval, then it's sufficient to set sigma square to be 1. So sigma, it's basically all these random, the loss should decrease uh, at a uh, faster than a Gaussian random variable with variance sigma square. That's what this definition means. It's a bit of a technicality used to prove things, but if your loss functions are well behaved, if they are bounded and so on, then this, then uh, you can easily compute what sigma square is. So, so there is this one technicality, but modulo this, we have this particular result, which we'll prove next. Any questions? And here lambda is just a real number, it's called for any lambda. We are taking the, this random variable, subtracting its mean and looking at its moment generating function. Okay? And that moment generating function now is going to be less than e to the lambda square sigma square by 2. But if you don't like these definitions, they are not, it's not critical, just assume that L of WZ is in the finite range, 0 to 1 and then sigma square is just one. If you prove everything with this, then you're going to be safe, like this results are generalized. It's a little bit of, they just want to prove it in a more general fashion than assuming something like this. That's why they introduce it. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you a brief tutorial on mutual information and relative entropy. I know some of you have already seen it before in an information theory course, for others it might be new. Even if you have seen it, you may not have really used it much. So I'll give you a quick review of it and then we will go on to the proof, okay? So, we'll now discuss mutual information and cool back Leibler divergence, also known as relative entropy. So if y and z 
Let's say that we have two random variables. with joint distribution P of YZ. Then I of the mutual information between the two random variables is the integral of P of YZ log p of y z divided by p y of y p z of z dy dz assuming y and z are continuous random variables if they are discrete you get summation over y z p of y z then this is a mass function probability mass functions and you get this times log p of y z Okay, this is the mutual information between the two random variables. You can easily check that i of yz is zero if y and z are independent. Okay. If the random variables are independent, then the mutual information is zero between them. Uh, i of yz is always positive. The mutual information between two random variables is never negative. Uh, it's closely related to other information theoretic quantities such as entropy, h of y, which is a summation of py log py. The logs are always to the base e, unless otherwise stated. In my, it doesn't matter as such. And with the minus sign, thank you. Uh, and if it is a continuous random variable, we have differential entropy. I'll just still use capital H, although you should strictly speaking use lowercase h for differential entropy. Okay. How many of you have seen these quantities before? Mutual information. About more than half of the class have seen. So, I mean, the rest of you will have to like read up a textbook like Cover and Thomas. There are two or three chapters you should read up on it to understand what all this is. Since these are definitions, I will just keep, let you see it afterwards. Don't worry about writing all of it. You can see it later on. Conditional entropy. H of y given z. This is defined. Uh, actually, let's do one. Yeah, let's do this. This is the summation over p z of z. I'll just do it for the discrete random variables. If it's continuous random variables, you replace it with a integral times the summation over y uh, p of y given z. Uh, there's a minus in the front times log 2 p of y given z. So this is the definition of a conditional entropy of two random variables and if you look at this quantity this is basically the entropy of y given that z equals little z. If I fix little z then my distribution of y is p of y given z. Then and if I look at the condition of the entropy of y given z equals little z, this is a standard entropy, just a random variable with distribution p of y given z. So this is a definition of the entropy. And then the average with respect to z, which 
with respect to the distribution of this is known as the conditional entropy of y given z and we can show that h of y is always greater than h of y given z so that is conditioning reduces entropy however you cannot say something a relation between h of y and h of y given z equals little z these are not comparable so on average when you take the average with respect to this quantity the entropy of y is greater than the entropy of y given z however for a fixed z these two are not comparable the entropy could increase or decrease Entropy is sort of the most basic measure of uncertainty in a random variable. It's the first met information theoretic measure that you study in an information theory course. It tells you how much uncertainty is with respect to a random variable. Operationally, it tells you how many bits are required to describe a random variable on average. Okay? That's like a source coding theorem and so on. So again, this is all very basic. I know people who have seen this are getting bored, whereas people who haven't seen it, this is not enough. Uh, so I have to balance both sides when I teach it. So I'm going to just give you the, def the minimum definitions you need. Uh, I of YZ, the mutual information between two random variables that we defined before, can be decomposed as H of Y minus H of Y given Z. It can be written as h of z minus h of z given y, and it can be written as h of y plus h of z minus h of y comma z. These are different ways you can decompose mutual information into entropy terms. Okay. We also have a chain rule for mutual information. And the chain rule says that i of x, y, if you have three random variables, x, y, and z, you can decompose it in two ways. You can write it as i of x, z, plus i of y and z given x, or you can write it as i of y, z, plus i of x, z given y. So if you have the mutual information between x, comma, y, and z, so you can think of x, comma, y as another random variable say t, right? So this is a mutual information between t and z. Now the, defi now the definition of mutual information that we have, we can compute it. Right? This is the definition, so you have the joint distributions, if you, you can compute it, but there is an alternate way to compute it using what is called the chain rule. This mutual information can be written as the mutual information between say x and z plus the mutual information between y and z given x. And it can also be written as i of y and z plus i of x and z given y. So these are conditional mutual informations. This is conditional. So just like we have conditional entropy, we can also define conditional mutual information. I'll do that on the next page. Again, these are just definitions, so I'll let you look at the notes later, so you can uh, copy them. So, I of y, z given x, for example, is the conditional mutual information between y and z given x. And it's defined as summation of x in x, ex of x times i of y z given x equals little x, where the second quantity is just the summation over y and z e of y z given x log p of y z given x divided by p of y given x p of z given x. 
So this is the standard mutual information, just that you replace the joint distribution by the conditional one. And then for the conditional mutual information, you take average with respect to Px. So again, in an information theory course, mutual information is another fundamental quantity that comes up in the study of channel capacity between uh, and so on. So if you have taken a course, this is like fairly straightforward. If not, these are standard definitions. Even if you are not interested in say information theory, these metrics come up a lot in machine learning. So even when you're training deep neural networks and so on, often information theoretic metrics serve as like regularizations for the loss function. So in defining say variational autoencoder or even GANs and so on, a lot of information theoretic metrics are used. Yeah? So just knowing these metrics is going to be useful for you even if you are purely interested in machine learning and applying deep learning methods and training them. Even if you don't care about standard information theory or even statistical learning, these metrics are good to know because they are very widely used in training deep neural networks. Okay, so this is the story for information theory. The second quantity is Kullback Leibler divergence. So suppose uh, X uh, Px and Qx are two probability distributions over say x in the set x. We have two distributions and the relative entropy between p and q is the integral over px log px over qx. It's defined in this way. Uh, for this to be meaningful we do not want the denominator to be zero if the numerator is non zero. And so we assume that Q, if Qx is zero, then Px is always equal to zero. When Qx is zero, if this happens, then this quantity is still well defined. Otherwise, it becomes infinity. So we'll assume that whenever the denominator is zero, the numerator is forced to be zero. So in other words, the support of P, the, the, the values of X for which Px is non-zero is a subset of the values of, of X where Qx is non-zero. Again, there are some useful properties of relative entropy. One is that the relative entropy is always non-negative and equality happens if Px equals Qx for all X. So if you integrate this and if px equals qx, you have a log of 1, which is 0. So it's integral of 0, which is 0. So when p equals q, this is 0. Other than that, this quantity is always going to be non-negative. You can see the proof is pretty straightforward. If you can see any standard reference, it just uses the fact that log of 1 plus x is less than x. Like you can bound the loss function, the log by a linear function, and that's basically what the proof is. You can, I can, I will let you see a standard book for it. Uh, so there is a close relationship between relative entropy and mutual information. Uh, I of x y, which if you look at the say discrete case, it's p of x y log p of x y divided by px and py, this is the relative entropy between p of xy and the product distribution. Just by definition, if you think of this as the p distribution and the, this as the q distribution, immediately from the, de from the definition, this quantity is the relative entropy between this joint distribution and the product of the marginals. Px and Py. Okay, that's immediate from the definitions. And since this is positive, it follows that I of xy is positive as well. 
and um, if uh, x and y are independent, then this is going to be zero because the product will factorize the marginals and the mutual information is zero. We can also write i of x, y. There is an alternate characterization of this. If we expand things, it's the integral of d of p of y given x equals x. Let me write it as p of y given x equals x. P of y times px of x dx or in other words it's the expected value over x of d of p of y given x y given x equals x and py with respect to x. You can rewrite I mean here I'm using the continuous version otherwise it's the summation but you can re rewrite the mutual information in this form. Again, the proof is straightforward. You just take out px, take the summation over px outside. What remains inside is basically the relative entropy between these two distributions averaged with respect to px. Also, one can show that this is less than the expected value over x, d of p y given x, y given x equals x times q of y for any distribution qy. So if you have any other distribution, if you replace this py with any other distribution qy, you get an upper bound on mutual information. And this is often used in many variational bounds, like when you're doing variational inference in machine learning and so on. We won't do that, but these kinds of inequalities are heavily used. So they start with an information theoretic loss function and then to get a tractable loss function that can be that is amenable to training, this, this might be hard to compute, so they replace it with some you know approximate like this can be say a Gaussian distribution or something which is easy to compute. So these tricks are heavily used. I'm just giving you a few properties which will be necessary for us in our discussion. Okay. So this is all. Now, well, there is one particular property that I don't think anyone has probably seen before that is known as the Donsker Worthen Lemma. This is a very important lemma because it is the single mo most useful technique used in deriving all bounds on generalization error involving like information theoretic measures. So this is all the results that we have seen so far are clever applications of this lemma on relative entropy. So in that sense, it is the most important sort of property in all our discussion today, the long square worth and lemma. Okay, I'll tell you what it is, and then we will see the proof of it. It's important enough, and probably no one has seen it before, so I will prove it, uh, and then we will discuss its applications and in deriving the bound we mentioned before. Okay. Has anyone seen this lemma before? sort of like very commonly used in statistics but it has never really come up much in information theory. So let px and qx be two distributions on x in x. And the relative entropy between p and q is written in this way supremum of over f x in r Ep of fx minus log eq of e to the fx. So it's a very funny looking expression. When I first saw it, I had no intuition, and I don't think I still have much intuition, but it's a true property, very useful. So we want to compute the relative entropy between P and Q. And the way this quantity basically involves this integral over px, log px over qx. So this provides an alternative way to compute this relative entropy. Uh, it basically says that if you take any function f from x to r, okay, any function, you take the expectation 
of fx with respect to p. And you don't take the expectation of fx with respect to q, but instead you take the expectation of e to the fx with respect to q, and then take the log. Notice that if you put the log inside here, then the log will cancel the expectation and you get eq of fx here. But that doesn't work well. You don't do that. You don't interchange the log and the expectation. It's important to have log outside and the expectation inside. Okay. So, so the point here is that for any f, We have that the relative entropy between P and Q is going to be greater than EP of Fx minus log EQ of E to the F of X. For any function F, because it's a supremum and you have an equality here, for any function F that you can you pick, you get a lower bound on the relative entropy by taking the difference in the expectation of f of x. Now this is, you would like to have an, a, a, like uh, just eq of f of x, right? You might think very, a nice, intuitively nice sort of pleasing uh, bound could be ep of fx minus eq of fx. For it, but that's not true. You won't get the right lower bound if you did that. And in fact, if you change the log and the expectation, you will get ep of fx minus eq of fx, but the bound is going in the opposite way. If you think about it, if you interchange the log and the expectation, you end up upper bounding this quantity, so it doesn't work. And for those of you who know the Jensen's inequality, you can see what happens if you change the two. You will get eq of fx, but then you will end up upper bounding this quantity. So it's not the difference between ep of fx and eq of fx. Okay, but if you do it in this way, if you take the log here outside and put the exponential inside, this works. So for any function fx, this lower bound. You're always interested in lower bounding the relative entropy in these applications because you want to typically get an estimate for mutual information and you want to lower bound things. So you want to say the mutual information is at least this much between two random variables. And so you, are, so you can choose any function and then you can do some sampling to compute EP of fx and EQ of fx, and for any function you get a lower bound. So this is actually, this bound is also used for estimating mutual information from empirical statistics and so on. It's very widely used in statistics for many different applications. We have seen applications in GANs for this, using an F divergences, F GANs use it. Uh, differential privacy has applications of this bound. When I first saw it, like, I was just like surprised how many applications are there. Right? We never talk about it in information theory. So I don't understand, the, I cannot say I fully understand the lemma myself. I will show you the proof. And, but it will be interesting to see if anybody wants to just do a project on understanding this lemma and what are its properties and where it's used and if there are any variations of it. It can't be that this is the only thing out there, right? There must be many variations of it, how they are useful and so on. There is one variation that if we replace the relative entropy with like F divergences or Rennie divergences, there is a corresponding variational bound, which is widely used as well. Uh, we won't do that, we'll just stick to the standard one. Uh, but anyways, another way to think about it is for any function, EP of Fx is less than D of P and Q plus log eq of e to the fx. This is another way to just rewrite this bound if I bring this on the other side. If you have any function and you want to compute the expectation of that function with respect to the true distribution, but perhaps that distribution is intractable, you cannot compute this expectation directly. If you know of any other distribution that is close, provably close in the sense of relative entropy to it, then you can upper bound this expectation by d of pq plus this, which might be tractable uh, approximation. So these kinds of bounds are also used. And why do you call this a, a variation? It, this is sort of a variation because it gives you lower bound. Like the relative entropy why, can always... Why the word variation? I think it is uh, sort of saying that you can change this function. Any choice of function gives you a lower... You have a freedom of choosing which function is used. 
that so even this bound here is a variational upper bound on mutual information because here you have freedom in choosing this marginal distribute any choice of q gives you an upper bound so if you have this sort of freedom of choosing one quantity and giving a guarantee on bound one way or the other this is a variational upper bound and this is a variational lower bound that's how much i know So here the point is any f will give you a lower bound, so that's why it's defined. Okay, so to do the to show this is very important, so we'll do a proof of this. So proof first we want to show that d of p q is greater than. Uh, or actually let's do the first case the lower bound this is less than the right hand side so this is the right hand side we want to show that d of p q is less than the right hand side in particular we will show that for some f of x let's say some f star of x d of p q equals e p of f star of x minus log e q of e to the f star of x so we'll show that there exists one candidate f star for which d of p q equals this right hand side evaluated at f star then since we are taking the supremum over all f this upper bound will follow because for one f it's equal and we are maximizing over f we can only improve the objective and we get an upper bound and the claim is that f star that does it is log of px divided by qx so p and q are two distributions so for each x i can evaluate log px over qx this is well defined because if qx is zero px is guaranteed to be zero so that part is uh, we can we can ignore those values of x, and for all other x, f x is defined like this. And then if you substitute this f star in this expression, then we actually get d of p q. So let's look at the first term. This is the expectation with respect to p of f star of x. So this is the expectation with respect to p of log of p x over q x. What is that? Does that look familiar? That is this quantity, d of pq, right? This is ep of log of px over qx. So if we expand, it's the integral over px log px over qx. So this part is already done for you. What about the second term? We want to now argue that the second term is zero. Why is it zero? Because let's look at this eq of e to the x star of x. So it's eq of e to the log of px over qx. What is e to the log px over qx? That e and log cancel. So this is eq of px over qx. So if you simplify this, you will get this to be eq. Uh, let me just write. It's all lowercase, by the way. Even if I write uppercase. Okay. So why is this quantity zero? Or so okay, you cannot see it, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I'll do it on the next page. Or let me write it here. This quantity is e of q x p x over q x. Can anyone see what this quantity is? What will this simplify to? You integrate with respect to qx this quantity. It's one, right? It's going to be one. 
because this is the integral of qx times px over qx dx. So the qx is cancelled, it's the integral of px dx, the integrating over the probability, that is 1, and then we take log of 1, that will be 0. So that's the idea, that's basically it, that shows why this f star works. So I'll do the proof next, just write down all the steps. So note ep of fx is ep of log px over qx. So this is the integral of px log px over qx, which is the relative entropy between p and q. And eq, this is f star, of f star of x is eq of px over qx, the integral over qx, px over qx dx, which is the integral over px dx, which is 1. So. <laughs> So these are just say, things I discussed on the previous page. So as a result of this, Ep of f star of x minus log Eq or yeah log Eq of e to the f star of x equals d of p and q. So we have shown as a result of this that d of p q is less than the supremum of f from x to r ep of fx minus log eq of e to the f of x. This is one way of the Donsker burden lemma. That the relative entropy is upper bounded by the supremum because there is one f for which it is equal to eq, so it's upper bounded by the supremum. Now we have to show the other side. Now we want to show that d of p q is less than e p of f x or is lower is greater than or equal to e p of f x minus log e q of e to the f x for all functions f. We show this we are done then it has to be equal to it right now we need to show this. So the construction is a bit uh, like this one is not an easy proof. You have, I mean, you have once you see the trick, you can then do it. But the trick is a bit interesting. So we want to show this part now, the second half of the proof. And we cannot guess a function because this has to be true for every function. So whatever construction we come up with should be general enough so it holds for any function. So let me show you what how the standard proof works for any any given function f of x what can we do is we define a new distribution q f of x which is e to the f x q x divided by the integral of e to the f x qx dx. So qf is a, is a valid distribution because you have the numerator and you're integrating out it in the denominator. So it's a well-defined distribution, it's positive um, and uh, for all x because this is positive, this is positive and so on and it integrates to 1 because when you integrate the numerator it cancels with the denominator. Now we define zf to be log of the denominator. Let's define the log of the denominator to be zf. Okay. This is sometimes known as a partition function and so on. It's not important here. So what I have is we can write qf of x as e to the fx qx divided by zf 
or actually not ZF, E to the ZF. So Z has the log And this can be written as e to the fx minus zf times qx. So everywhere my upper q, case q and lower case q are the same, so don't get confused. Is this clear so far? Okay, so now what are we going to do with this q? If we have defined some distribution, we will cons we will uh, Simplify the following quantity in two ways. We'll take this quantity and rewrite it in two ways. Okay. One way will give us the right hand side, the other way will give us a bound on the left hand side. And we'll compare the two and we will be done. So, let me go on the next page and show you how this is simplified. So, okay, this is the definition. Now what is the ratio, what is qf of x by qx? We have constructed qf of x, qx is given to us and by our construction we can easily compute the ratio of qf by q. Let's look, look here, qf of x is this quantity times qx. So when I bring it on the left hand side, I'm left with e to the fx minus zf. And when I take the log of this, I know that log of qf of x by qx is log of e to the f of x minus zf, right, which is f of x minus zf. So when you take now the expectation, That is the expected value over p of e to the fx. Now zf is a constant. It does not depend on t. It's a constant term. It's no longer a function of x, right? So I can write zf outside. But what is zf? zf was defined to be exactly log integral of x in x e to the fx qx dx so this is ep of fx minus log eq of e to the fx so this is what we had on the right hand side this is one part of the of the simplification the other part that I will do is I will show that this quantity bounds the relative entropy between P and Q. What I will show is that this quantity is going to be less than or equal to the relative entropy between P and Q for any function f. And as a result of this, this quantity will be upper bounded by the relative entropy between P and Q for any function f and we will get to this part. This is greater than this and we will be done. Any questions so far? Oh, so, so you are okay with this part? You are okay with this? So now we are taking expectation with respect to P on both sides. With EP of Fx minus EP of Zf. The point is Zf is a number. It's not a random variable. Zf is this quantity. So it's a constant. 
with respect to P. So you don't need to put it in the expectation. Even if you put EP, it doesn't make change anything. It's like expected value of a constant, like one. What is it? It's the same one. However, if you look at the definition of ZF, it is this quantity. So now we have to show this other part and then we will be good. So how do we do that? Well, let's start with again looking at this quantity EP of log QF of X by QX. What I will do is I will multiply and divide by PX. And then I will write it like this, log of px by qx, okay. So I can write this as ep of log px by qx plus ep of log qf of x by px. Then I can write this as EP log PX by QX minus EP log PX by QF of X. Just changing the order here. The first term is the relative entropy between P and Q. And the second term is the relative entropy between P and QF. Okay, and lo and behold, this quantity is less than the relative entropy between P and Q because this quantity is non-negative. That completes the proof. So now we have shown that this quantity is upper bounded by this and this quantity equals the EP of Fx minus log Eq of e to the fx, which means for any function f, we have this upper bound. And as a result, we get the equality from to combine everything. Any questions about this? Are there other proofs for this? This is the easiest one that I know. So there is a whole, I'm sure, so that's not something I would like to know myself. Like I have to say I'm not an expert in any of these topics. I'm myself learning it and teaching these topics. So from what I have seen, this is the easiest proof. But I suspect there might be a much deeper connection. It seems very superficial, right? Like some algebra that works here, yeah. given how important the result is to the field. So I suspect there must be a broader theory maybe in the field of statistics. So if anybody wants to look into it and do, do a small project, I'll be very happy to learn from it. So, there is a similar sort of connection between alpha uh, divergence, f, di f divergences, and its variational characterization. So there is a similar sort of connection. But it will be interesting to see, if, for example, if we restrict uh, the P and Q to be in certain class, or if there is, there is a general theory for this sort of problem. So that will be very interesting. I don't know myself. Yeah, I was just thinking that uh, you know the quantity you define is it's just a functional of f of x, really, right? So like there's no you Functional, uh, you can't do like variation calculus or something to prove that this is the, oh, the maximum see. bounded I by deep infinity or something. I see, it must be like like you're saying, so we're all functions, so right? Yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah, the people can do that. Yeah, that's done. Then. So that is another, there might must be other proofs to see. I would be, I feel that there are inherent limitations from this bound in the information theoretic approaches. But this is the easiest one, does not require any like calculus, like you know, Lagrangians or any sort of variational calculus and works out well. So we'll take a 10 minute break and continue.